Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. If you've just walked in the door, please make sure that you sign in. It's not to monitor you. It's just to make sure that your name gets put into the raffle that we'll have for Dr. Akua's most recent publication um, on seven steps to black student success. So thank you all so much for being here. You know, it's lunch hour. There's a million other things that you all could have you know, identified or prioritized, but you prioritize this space. So I really appreciate it. This is the first of our three-part Black Heritage Month Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Carrie Bolin, and I have the distinct pleasure of working alongside a group of dedicated colleagues towards advancement of inclusion, belonging, and equity here at the institution. And in doing so, I want to pause because we are reflective on the privilege we've been given to serve at this institution of higher learning, and want to pause to acknowledge that we do this work on the land, on lands that have been stolen, lands that have thrived from the often fatal expense of forcefully enslaved black people. So before we begin, I'd like to honor the Sheshi Kawanga village and Quiche Nation alongside the remarkable legacy of the African diaspora. Absolutely. It's in the spirit of recognizing those legacies, histories of the past, that we built a lecture series that would not only invite us to sort of broaden our cultural lens, but more importantly, call us to action as we consider the long overdue awakening of systemic racism and its deadly impact on black and brown bodies in America. I can't think of anyone better than today's speaker to activate us towards greater action than Dr. Chike Akua. Serving as an assistant professor of um, educational leadership, um, at Clark Atlanta University and an African-centered leadership strategist to institutions across the globe, Dr. Kua has written nearly a dozen publications focused on African-centered education and has produced a series of African origin historical videos online while crafting impactful online curricula for students, parents, and professional development for teachers. With an earned doctorate in educational policy studies from Georgia State University, he has been named, or has been na featured rather, in Ebony Mag Magazine and more recently in Black Enterprise Magazine for his works as an educational leader. PCC is remarkably blessed to share space with his outstanding scholar activist, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Chike Akua. A great African-American scholar by the name of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays said, it's 11.59 on the clock of destiny. And life is like a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon you, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it. But it's up to you to use it. You'll suffer if you lose it. Give account if you abuse it. It's only a minute, but eternity is in it. And with that minute, you, me, and we can change and transform the world. So if you really believe that we in this room can change and transform the world, would everyone please say, Ashe? Ashe. A little stronger, Ashe? Ashe. That's right. So Ashe is a West African word, which means I agree. It also means let it be so. But it also represents the activating energy and the uh, pr presence and power of the spirit that is both within us and around us at all times. And so I use that word ashe as a call and response today uh, because when I say something that I want you to remember, I'm going to have you to repeat that word after me. Uh, when I say something I definitely don't want you to forget, I'm going to ask you to repeat that word after me. But you don't have to wait until I say it. If I say something that leads to an instant awakening, then you can say Ashe. If I say something that taps your spirit or touches your soul, if you see something in the presentation that awakens your consciousness to something you were never taught but thought that you should have been taught, then you can say Ashe, and that lets me know we're all on the same page. Ashe? Ashe. All right. Well, thank you all uh, so much for being here today, and thank you, Dr. Boleyn, for that wonderful introduction. I am very excited to be here uh, to share with you, but let me first begin by giving you greetings uh, from Clark Atlanta University, where I'm honored to serve on the faculty in the Department uh, of Educational Leadership. And of course, Clark Atlanta University is one of our great HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. It's customary that whenever African people gather together that we begin by giving honor to the Most High, who is known by many names and worshiped in many ways, certainly the one source and the one force through which we all live, move, and have our being. Ashe? Ashe. This is an Adinkra symbol, symbol from West Africa, and it is called Jiniyame. Can everybody say Jiniyame? Jiniyame? And it simply represents the omnipotence of the Most High. 
And so when we come across unfamiliar symbols or, or concepts, I, I will be uh, sharing those with you and I may ask you to repeat them after because I think one of the challenges that we face um, is the linguistic challenge because one of the first things that was taken from African people and from indigenous people and so forth was our languages. And our language is our lens, Ashe? So that, that's going to be very important. It's also customary when African people gather together that we honor our ancestors. For there's an African proverb which says, if we stand tall, it is because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. Or as Dr. Jacob Carruthers has said, indeed, our stride is wide because we're walking in the footsteps of giants. Ashe? Um, it is always exciting anytime I have an opportunity to share um, with students and faculty and the community alike. <laughs> Um, I've had the opportunity to go to a number of colleges and universities around the country. And uh, one of the things that typically happens is something in the ancient tradition of, of Kemet called the Wahimi Mesu. Can everyone say Wahimi Mesu? That is a rebirth or a reawakening that occurs. And that is why you see smiles on the faces of these who participated in something similar to this. That Wahimi Masu, that reawakening or rebirth is being birthed into a state of higher consciousness and awareness about who we are, where we come from, and where we must go. And so I'm thankful to be here. And as you can see uh, by my schedule, I have a very demanding schedule uh, this semester, but I'm in it to win it. And we're going to make sure that, that this message goes forth with power and conviction everywhere I'm called to be. Um, yes, so. Um, if you have your phone, would you hold your phone in the air for just a second? Just hold it up. Hold it up in the air. Wave it like you just don't get No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you're going to see some pictures and images that you may want to get a shot of. Um, and, I, and I'm reminded of the words of Listervelle Middleton, who said, sharpen your eye and tune your ear so you know what you see and understand what you hear. You've heard it said before that a picture is worth what, everybody? A thousand words. So you're going to see some pictures and images that you're going to want to get a shot of. But you can't just look with your two physical eyes. You have to look with what ancient Africans called the ujat. Everybody say ujat. The ujat is uh, the first eye. Some people call it the third eye, but it's really the first eye, the eye of all seeing enlightenment that allows us to see beyond the physical realm and into the mental and spiritual dimensions. So our topic today is from history to destiny. What does it mean to be black? From history to destiny, what does it mean to be black? And the reason I'm asking this question, what does it mean to be black, is because I believe we need a, a radical redefinition of what it means to be black, since we have all been subjected to gangsterized and criminalized and hypersexualized images of blackness. I believe it requires that we have a radical redefinition of blackness, but you can make that choice for yourself as you see the presentation. I'm going to be speaking from a number of the ideas in my most recent uh, publication, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success. But I have to give you a warning. This presentation has been specifically designed to blow your mind. And when I first started doing these pre presentations, sometimes the audience would be quiet and I didn't understand why. And I, I asked one of my friends, he said, he said, man, Chica, he said, people haven't seen stuff like this before. So here's what you can do to help me as I monitor your thoughts and emotions. If you're having one of these mind-blowing moments, just, just go like this so that I know what you're feeling and what you're sensing. Ashe? Ashe. And, and as I say that, I, listen, don't believe a word that I say. <laughs> do your own research. But I promise you that when you do, and you do the research from those scholars who have dedicated their life to what I'm about to share with you, I think you'll draw some of the same conclusions. So if y'all are ready to get started, everybody say, let's get it. Let's get it. All right, I want to take you back to a time when black people led the world in scientific innovation, literary production, and wealth creation. I think I got my first mind blown. Mind's blown right there. A lot of people are not aware that there was a time when African people led the world in scientific innovation, literary production, and wealth creation. And when the world came to Africa to learn from Africans, and when they came there, they didn't refer to them as the N-word or the B-word. Ashe? Ashe? And they didn't find those Africans referring to themselves as the N-word or the B-word. Okay? And so what I want to do 
is I, I, my presentation is broken down into several sessions. And each session will be about 10 minutes or so, okay? So session one asks, who were the ancient Kemites and what did they look like? All right? Uh, when all life on planet Earth began, it began deep in Central Africa, where you see this red arrow going. Right near Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. And then civilization spread up the Nile River Valley. The river uh, was the world's first cultural superhighway. It facilitated transportation up and down the river. It facilitated irrigation, irrigation of crops as they began to dig canals right off of the river for the irrigation of crops. So transportation and irrigation and then communication as they're going up and down the river, they're meeting new people and establishing diplomatic relations and thus civilization. So the Nile River was the world's first cultural superhighway. Now the original names tell the whole story. What we today call Africa in ancient times was called Al Kibulan. Everybody say Al Kibulan. That means land of the spirit people. Why land of the spirit people? Because we brought spirit to everything that we did. We brought spirit to reading and writing and language and literature, architecture, engineering, mathematics, uh, medicine, science, and technology. We brought spirit to everything that we did, but now we live in a society that attempts to despiritualize us. Matter of fact, in some of the research literature now, they're talking about that, that when black children go to school, there is this phenomenon called spirit killing, where they, they don't go to school to remember who they are, they go to school to forget. And to have an alien I cultural identity imposed upon them rather than understanding their authentic cultural identity. Ashe? The original names tell the whole story. Remember, our language is our lens. And so uh, great empires spread up, sprung up along the Nile River Valley. And you can tell something significant by these names. What we today call Sudan in ancient times was called Nubia. Everybody say Nubia. Nubia. What we today uh, call Egypt in ancient times was called Kemet. Everybody say Kemet. What we today call Ethiopia in ancient times was called Kush. Everybody say Kush. Kush. Now, that has different meanings to different people, right? <laughs> and I wasn't aware of this until a number of years ago when I was uh, presenting uh, at Tuskegee University in Alabama, and they enjoyed the presentation and asked me to go to uh, nearby Booker T. Washington High School and present it there as well. And I did, and when I got to this point in the presentation and I said, Kush, instead of the students repeating after me, it was about two or 300 students, they just all fell out laughing. And I, I was like, what are y'all laughing about? I didn't know I said something funny. They said, well, Dr. Cool, when we say Kush, we're referring to? Yeah. Ah, so I said, isn't that interesting that someone took the name of your sacred and holy homeland and turned it into something that'll get you locked up? Turned it into something that'll get you locked down. Then I asked the question, how many of y'all know, and it was all black students, asked, how many of y'all know somebody's locked up? Almost all the hands that went up, right? And I said, well, we can take it to science class, and are you aware that all of the chemicals that you need to be high are already in your body? You just have not been taught the sacred science of how to trigger the release of those chemicals. Otherwise, you could feel high all the time. Look, I'm high right now, y'all. <laughs> but but I, I, I haven't been smoking anything. I've only been drinking water, OK? But the other thing, we, we took it from science class to math class. And this is the same question that I asked people at the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. I, I put the challenge out for some research to be done. Because this, this issue of, of marijuana is, is really deep. I said, can you do some research with your students and ask them to find out the number of black people who have been arrested for possession or distribution of marijuana in comparison to the white males who have become multimillionaires and billionaires in the cannabis industry? <laughs> Boy, it got really quiet there like it did here. Wow, isn't that interesting? They, they, so with the stroke of a pen, somebody could just say, okay, now it's legal, and then go and create multi-millionaires while at the same time black families and communities were decimated because it was criminalized. Ashe? Deep. 
But I don't want to, that's a whole different presentation. I just, when I see the term Kush, that's what comes to mind, I say. So what I want to focus in for the time that we're together is up in uh, North East Africa, uh, the land of Kemet. And the reason I want to focus there is because there has been much, much misinformation and miseducation about ancient Kemet. But what makes it significant is that all of these civilizations were high-tech civilizations. But Kemet did the best job of preserving and documenting the knowledge, the high-tech knowledge of the Nile Valley. Ashe? Ashe. All of these were great empires. Do you know the difference between an empire and a kingdom, everybody? An empire is made up of many different kingdoms. These are empires of Kemet, empires of Cush, empires of Nubia, all right? But as we look at uh, the roots of the name Kemet, drawing from the work of Brother Tony Browder in his book, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, when you see this kind of writing right here, uh, what do you call that kind of writing, everybody? Hieroglyphics. Interesting. Because hieroglyphics is a Greek term, but that's not Greek writing. Remember, our language is our lens. The original name for this kind of writing is called Medunetra. Everybody say Medunetra. Medunetra. Medunetra translates to mean word of God. Wait a minute. When you hear that, what do you usually think of? And most people aren't aware that African people wrote that too, but again, that's a different presentation. Ashe? Ashe. So here we have a charred or burnt piece of wood that represents the K and the M sound. They didn't use vowels the way that we do today. Later, scholars will come along and add vowels for ease of pronunciation, okay? Uh, then you have the owl, which also represents the M sound. Then you have a bread loaf, which represents the T sound. This by itself, everybody, means black. What does it mean? Black. It means black. But in Medunetra writing, you have a determinative. And de a determinative determines what the rest of the word is referring to. So what did you say that means right there, everybody? Wow. Okay, so X with a circle around it means nation. So what does this mean together? Wow. Hmm. I promise you, you won't see this on the History Channel. I promise you, you won't see this in K through 12 social studies textbooks. I promise you, you probably won't even see it in college textbooks, and you have to ask yourself, why is that? Ashe? Ashe? Because we have all seen the falsification of African civilizations when they show the ancient Egyptians as white people with a tan. <laughs> so what I have to do then is I have to correct the record. That's, that's, that's what we do oftentimes as scholars. And so one of the things that I've done to help to uh, make it clear for people is I went back and I got some photos of some African statues out of Kemet. And then I put them right alongside um, the faces of African Americans who you would recognize, okay? And that's just to approximate the appearance of the ancient Kemites. So let's, let's take a look. So for example, when I look at the face of, of King Mentuhotep, when I looked at his face, I said, man, he looks, he looks a little bit like LeBron James. <laughs> Congratulations to the king for breaking the scoring record last night, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> when I see the face of King Khafre, the profile, I say, I've seen that face before. Where have I seen that face before? Right? And then, when I see the face of King Amenhotep III, take a look at the, the nose, the high cheekbones, the lips. I said, man, he looks a lot like a brother who used to play in the NFL by the name of Adrian Peterson. Can you see a slight similarity there? See, I want you to be very clear about what these people look like so that when I show you what they did, it will be very clear. Ashe? Ashe. Take a look at Queen T. Now, you may not have seen this particular image before, but you've seen that face many, many times. You just didn't realize what you were looking at. So take a very careful look because you've seen this face many, many times because she bears a striking resemblance to former First Lady Michelle Obama. Ashe? Ashe? When we look at the face of King Amenemet, take a look at the nose, the lips, the, the wide nose, the thick lips, 
Even though it's been chiseled away, you got, got the locks. In my next life, I'm going to have locks like that. But right now, i got to <laughs> rock what I got. I'm part of the bald head brotherhood. But in my next life, I'm going to have locks like that. But when I saw that, I said, man, he looks a lot like a brother who used to play defensive back for the Atlanta Falcons by the name of Dante Robinson. Can you see it? Wow. All right. When I look at the face of King Sinwo Shrep, I see the actor Mahershala Ali. Mm-hmm. When I look at the face of King Huni, I had to take you back to the golden age of hip hop and KRS-One, whose whose name stands for knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everything. When I see the face of Queen Amanertis, I see Lupita Nyong'o. When I see the face of King Narmer, the founding king of Kemet, again, look at the high cheekbones, the nose, the lips, the eyes, I see the gospel singer Kirk Franklin. Ashe? So this is just to approximate the appearance, but that can't necessarily be said to be scientific. But this can. Let's go to one of the greatest scholars that we've ever seen, and that's the Senegalese multi-scholar, Dr. Sheikh Antadjia. He's a historian. He was a historian, linguist, physicist, anthropologist, political scientist, and activist. And in his research, he produced 12 areas of empirical evidence that the ancient Kemites were indeed black. How many areas of empirical evidence? I can't hear you. And by empirical, we mean hard evidence, not speculation, but hard evidence. One of those areas of evidence was called the melanin dosage test. You know melanin is what gives the skin its pigment, pigment. But again, in K through 12 textbooks and in many college textbooks, you won't find much Uh, about melanin research, and it's so much more than skin pigmentation. Nonetheless, Dr. Diop went to the the, uh, Louvre Museum in France. He was a student at the Sorbonne in France. And he said, if you will give me access to the royal mummies of Kemet, because, you know, the French had stolen those mummies and put them in the museum. Many of our artifacts have been stolen and placed in in foreign museums. Ashe? Ashe. He said, if you will give me access to the royal mummies of Kemet, I will take a skin sample, and I will put that skin sample in a solution of ethyl benzoate, and I will sh- you can shine a light on it, and it causes the melanocytes, the melanocytes are the cells that hold the melanin, and it causes the melanocytes to become fluorescent, and you can literally count the number of melanocytes and determine the shade of skin of the person that you're analyzing. Those melanocytes do not deteriorate over time. Ashe? Do you think they gave him access to the mummies? No. No, they didn't. But for two years, he was absolutely unrelenting. And so finally, they gave him access to the mummies. His findings were absolutely astounding. I want you to take a good look at the face of Dr. Sheikh Antadia, because this is a direct quote for him. He said, they were black, black, more black than I. But that's not where it gets deep. Here's where it gets deep. I have found that many other people have done the same research before me, but they never published their findings. The reason I know this is because I found that the skin of many mummies had been completely scraped. They denied him access to the mummies because they already knew the truth. And you would be amazed at the great lengths people will go to make sure people don't know the truth about our history and our culture. Ashe? Ashe. Would you raise your hand if you're learning something? Let me just see. Keep your hand up. Look around the room because you're not the only one. All right, hands down. So now we can move to session two. Now that we know who they were and what they looked like, what did the ancient Kemites accomplish? And remember, what they did is only representative of what was going on all throughout the Nile Valley, not just in Egypt. Ashe? Ashe. So we want to start with Imhotep, the father of medicine. He was the first recorded physician in human history. He was also the architect of the first pyramid, which was the step pyramid at Saqqara. He was a mathematician and advisor to the king, priest, poet, multidisciplinary genius. Now, anytime you see this wonderful face right here, I want you to replace that face with your face because I lead study tours to Egypt. And if you could go back and see some of these things for yourself, how many of you all would be interested in going on a study tour to, to explore and learn about some of these things, okay? And so anytime you see that face, I want you to place that face with your face. So who's that in that picture, everybody? 
That's right. That's you because you got to go back and see it for yourself. I got to a point where it wasn't enough for me to look at it in a magazine, a newspaper, or on TV. I had to go back and see it for myself, especially since the images have been completely falsified. Why are ancient Kemetic people like Imhotep often not portrayed as Africans or black people? And it seems like every five years or so, they come out with a new movie depicting the ancient Kemites as anything other than black. Ashe? Ashe. Or, in addition to that, they always come out with a new movie about a biblical figure and showing them as other than black as well. That's another presentation, though. Ashe? Ashe. But I will never forget when The Mummy came out around 2000, 2001. I was a middle school language arts teacher, and my students were telling me about it. They said, Dr. Mr. Cool, you got to see this movie. I said, what's it about? They said, well, there was this man named Imhotep, and he was putting curses on people and killing people. I said, wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> the historical Imhotep was the first recorded physician in human history, a mathematician, an architect of the Step Pyramid, priest, poet, multidisciplinary genius. They said, well, in the movie, he was killing people. I said, wait a minute, if what you're telling me about this movie is true, that movie is an insult to African people. They were like, no, it's not that deep, Mr. Akua. I said, yes, it is that deep. I said, what if 5,000 years from now, somebody decided to make a movie and they named the main character who was a villain, what if they gave him the name Martin Luther King? They were like, no, they can't do that. I said, why not? He said, because he was a good person. He tried to help people and bring people together. I said, well, I just told you the historical truth about Imhotep, but when you don't know your history, people can tell you anything about your history and have you pay your money to be insulted. Oftentimes, when we go to the movies, we pay our money to be insulted. So much so, they made so many multi-millions of dollars off of, of these. They made, I think, three of those mummy movies. Ashe? Ashe. And those movies are laced with heavy uh, special effects that captivate the attention that keeps you from analyzing what you're seeing. Ashe? Ashe. Here we have the Alms Mathematics Papyrus. This is the oldest math textbook in the world. Mm -hmm. It contains examples of algebra, trigonometry, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, square root, area, circumference, volume, and much, much more. In the preface of the Alms Mathematics Papyrus is written the scientific method. And, and, and it says that this is the correct method of investigating all things in order to know all things that, that exist, each mystery and every secret, that our ancestors has unlocked the, the mysteries of the universe through mathematics. And the Alms Mathematics Papyrus is almost 4,000 years old, but it's known to be a copy of an older African text. Somebody say, how do you know? know. Because the writer, Amos, says... In the papyrus, this is a copy of an older African text. <laughs> but you won't know that if you can't read your original languages. What languages were you offered in high school and in college? That's not rhetorical. Go ahead and tell me. What languages were you offered? French. 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 Italian, German, Chinese. Spanish. Chinese, with the exception of the Chinese, all the languages of the colonizer. You didn't hear what I said. Remember, we said earlier, your language is your lens. So if all you know is the languages of the colonizer, then you don't have the proper lens to even evaluate your own culture. Is this making sense? So as we go a little bit further, I need to see who woke today. So how many, how many pyramids do you see in this picture? Just call out your answer. Uh, repeat after me, please. Sometimes in life, sometimes in life, you got to look twice. So let's count these out together, starting with the small ones at the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Of the big three, which one is the Great Pyramid? A, B, or C? Call out your answer. Hearing several different answers. I heard a lot of B's and C's. Okay, the correct answer is actually C, the one to the far right. But this is like math class. It's not enough to have the right answer. You have to know why the answer is what it is. So prior to going to Kemet, I always thought the one in the middle looked like it was a great pyramid because it looked like it's the largest. But if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, it's sitting on higher ground, and it's closer to the camera. So the one to the far right is a great pyramid. 
covering 481 feet high, covering 13 acres around, okay? Um, and many of us were taught and told that the purpose of the pyramids is that they were what, everybody? That, that they were tombs. Well, there are more pyramids in Nubia to the south than there are in Egypt. Those pyramids in Nubia are tombs. These are not. Ashe? Ashe? And one of the reasons that we know that is because these were astronomical observatories where our ancestors studied the sacred sciences, where they were calculating the precession of the stars and of different constellations. There are actually passageways that are in perfect alignment with certain stars and constellations. So much so that people have trouble understanding how the pyramids were built. As a matter of fact, they're such a mathematical and engineering marvel, couldn't have been built by human hands, certainly not black hands, it must have been built by? Aliens. How is it that we all got the same program? <laughs> Did y'all practice this before I got here, sir? <laughs> all we have to do is look at the available literature on this, the Alms Mathematics Papyrus, for example, problem number 56, and many others, shows these Africans calculating the slope of, of how to build a pyramid. Dr. Theophilo Benga tells us that electronic calculators in use today have not come up with superior breakdowns to those presented in the special table of the papyrus Wren. He calls it the Wren papyrus. I call it by its original name, the Abends Mathematics papyrus, because Wren was a Scottish lawyer who either stole it or bought it. Ashe? So what happens is you have African books named after uh, the thieves who took them. Ashe? Ashe? I hope nobody comes along years later and, and takes one of my books and puts their name on it. Right? So, uh, but not only this, another reason that we know that it wasn't built by aliens, and I'm not saying that the ancient Kemites didn't have a cosmic consciousness, but we know the mistakes that they made. If you take a look, you've got Imhotep's step pyramid. Then Seneferu comes along and tries to build what we call a true pyramid without steps. But you can see he made a mistake and mismeasured his angles. Ashe? Ashe. So they call that the bent pyramid. But then his son Khufu comes along and builds the great pyramid. And then his son Khafre, the brother that looked like Kobe Bryant, comes along and builds the second largest pyramid. And his son Menkare comes along and builds uh, the, the next one. What we're looking at here is African progressive perfection, each generation improving upon the last. But the demographers and researchers tell us that this may be the first generation of African Americans who do not exceed the accomplishments of their parents. Ashe? Ashe. We got to change that. And one of the ways that we change that is by teaching them the truth of who they are, where they come from, and what they can do. Ashe? Ashe? Another way that we change that is by teaching them their true and authentic culture instead of the gangsterized, criminalized, and hypersexualized images that have been injected and imposed upon them. So now we're going from the Nile Valley of Africa all the way to America. And we've all seen this picture before, and some of us have even been to D.C. and been to the Lincoln Memorial. But when you look at that, you may not be aware that you're looking at an exact replica of an African monument. This is a statue of Pharaoh Ramesu. The Greeks called him Ramesses. And you see him seated in the same meditative posture as Abraham Lincoln. Now you could say, well, come on, Dr. Kuhl, that's just a coincidence. Well, if I were to show you the original drawings, the original drawings for, for the Lincoln Memorial were actually... Uh, with a pyramid behind him, okay? But let me take you to the Temple of Abu Simbel, and what we see is not one, but how many colossal statues of Ramesu do you see? I can't hear you. How many? Four. One more time. Four. Okay. So we see one was destroyed by an earthquake. Uh, but typically, ancient Africans were master builders who built for eternity, and what they built is still standing unless someone came along and destroyed it. Ashe? But in this remote case, uh, it was a, a, uh, an earthquake. But if we were to go in between these statues, you come to the door of a temple. And something amazing happens in this temple only two times a year, everybody. The sun shines a beam of light down this corridor and lights up the face of the statue of the king. Only two times a year. 
on the day of his coronation and on his birthday. Mm. Now I ask you, what kind of architectural, engineering, mathematical mastery do these ancient Africans have to have in order to orient a temple so that a beam of light, sunlight, shines down the corridor to light up the face of the king? We bad, y'all. I mean, damn, right? <laughs> Where do you even begin to do that calculation? Right? But then I discovered that this temple was not built from the ground up. It was carved out of the side of a mountain. Meaning they dug into the mountain, chiseled away all the rock. You thought you saw some statues. Those are actually pillars holding it up. They dug it and chiseled away all the rock and exposed uh, uh, what they wanted to leave behind, and they chiseled in the writings of the Medunetra on the wall from floor to ceiling and even on the ceiling. But how many, how many colossal statues did you say you saw of Ramesu there? Four. I can't hear you. How many? Four. Where have I seen four faces carved into the side <laughs> of a mountain before? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. As Ashra Kwesi says, somebody knows something about you that you don't even know about yourself. And people make multi-billions of dollars a year off of our ignorance because we do not know who we are and we have been convinced that we're nothing but the N-word and the B-word. Somebody benefits when we don't know and it ain't us. Ashe? Ashe. But it not only affects the African-American community, it diminishes the world because the world is in need of our brilliance and our healing power that came through us. Every culture brings something that is a gift to the world. And the gift that we have to give to the world has been stifled, silenced, and diminished. And as a result, the world suffers because of racism and white terrorism. Ashe? Ashe. Here we see the Washington Monument, tallest structure in Washington, D.C. Now we can use our prior knowledge to make a hypothesis. What is a hypothesis, everybody? An educated yes. guess. Where do you think the design came from? <laughs> of course. I took this picture of Queen Hatshepsut's Tekken. Um, the ancient Chemites called it a Tekken. The Greeks called it an obelisk. It was a symbol of strength and stability. And I took this picture of Hatshepsut's Tekken with the sun rising behind it because you could tell what time of day it was based on how the sun cast its shadow on the Tekken. So it was used as a sundial, and that shadow would act as the hands of a clock, allowing you to tell what time of day it was, but also allowing them to enhance their astronomical calculations. Well, here we see the Washington Monument in front of a reflecting pool. Now, isn't it interesting that George Washington owned African people as slaves. But you choose an African monument to memorialize him. That's a problem to me. But imagine my amazement when I get to the temple of, of Amun-Ra, what do I see? There's your reflecting pool, and there is your Tekken over in the left-hand side. Ashe? Ashe. So these are just a few of the the things, uh, types of information that we share in honoring our ancestral obligations. Now, if this is helpful to you and you're learning something, get your phone out. And if you would like to receive video clips and different things like that that I can email to you, take a shot of this real quick and you can text, you can do it later. Text Dr. Kua to 22828. That will put you in our database. I promise not to spam you, but I will send out an email every. Uh, probably a couple times a month letting you know where I am in the country and also including some different video clips that, that you can check out about our history and our culture. So remember we said that black people led the world in scientific innovation, literary production, and wealth creation. When we talk about wealth creation, one of the things that has been left out, see it's one thing to have this consciousness and no capital. It's one thing to have this mentality but no money. And so one of the things that we want to teach young people is how to raise capital and consciousness because what we found is that there are some people in the black community who have consciousness but no capital. And then there's some who have capital but no consciousness. And those two camps argue amongst each other, right? 
people with the consciousness say, hey, you people with the capital, you should be building schools and you should be supporting black businesses. And, and people with the capital say, y'all need to stop complaining. America is the best place on earth. You should save. You should invest. And they're constantly going at each other. What was revealed to me was I had to be that brother that had capital and consciousness. And so I got together with my brother, my literal blood brother, uh, J.R. Fenwick, who is the CEO of Flip That Stock. And he started financial literacy for students. And so we, we have a capital and consciousness tour going on. where We're going around to colleges and universities and we're teaching black students how to invest, teaching them financial literacy through the stock market. And it's taking off. Ashe? Ashe. Right, so if you're interested in that, go ahead and get a quick shot of that. You can check that out at a later time. Session three. Session three. What is the relationship between African Americans, East Africans, and West Africans. Now, the reason I have this is because early on when I started doing these presentations, I would have somebody to say, well, Dr. Kuhl, that's really interesting, the things that you're saying about ancient Kemet, but that's in East Africa. African Americans were taken from West Africa. And my response to that is that's not incorrect, but it is incomplete. What a lot of people are unaware of is that there were six mass migrations out of the Nile Valley of Africa that when the Persians, Greeks, Romans, and Arabs inundated that area, there were six mass migrations out of that area from East Africa to West Africa. It took me a long time to get those arrows to move, but, <laughs> but I'm working on my technological skills. And when they migrated, they brought their science and technology with them, and they built the great empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhoi. Ashe? Ashe. So they didn't cease being from the Nile Valley, just like we didn't cease being from Africa when we were brought to America. Ashe? Ashe. And many of the people, not all, but some of the people in these West African areas know their connection to ancient Kemet, but they don't have the details. That's why when we uh, went on a study tour to Ghana this past uh, September, I was installed as a chief in the Asebu region, because in the Asebu region of Ghana, they know that they are the descendants of the ancient Kemites. But they have asked for help from other scholars to help to piece back together their story, because just like we were miseducated here as a result of slavery in America, they're still miseducated over there as a result of colonization. Ashe? Ashe. And so in West Africa, we had great universities like the University of Jeanne, still standing. We had the University of San Corre at Timbuktu. When I was growing up, we had a saying, man, I'll knock you all the way. I didn't know it was a real place. <laughs> Much less one of the great learning centers in the world where people came from all over Africa, Asia, and Europe to study from these Africans. There are over 100,000 manuscripts, yet untranslated, at Timbuktu today in need of young brilliant scholars to translate them, mathematical and ast astronomical manuscripts. Remember, when we are not properly educated, we can't give our gift to the world, and all humanity is diminished. Ashe? Ashe. What answers are we missing to humanity's greatest problems because we have not explored Africa's contributions and solutions? We're coming through and we're coming out of the pandemic by the grace of the Most High. But this is where it would be helpful to know about the majesty of the Moors who lifted Europe out of the Dark Ages with their science and technology because the plague was running rampant through Europe at that time. And they were able to subdue that and put it back on course. They ruled in Spain for almost 800 years but had an influence throughout all over Europe. Ashe? As Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, the Puerto Rican African historian, says African history is simply the missing pages of world history. Ashe? Ashe. Session four were the first Americans Africans. We're living in a time right now of tremendous cultural conflict, and we're seeing heavy backlash against this kind of teaching. Ashe? Ashe. Do you think this kind of teaching is helpful? Yes. Do you think it's needed and necessary? Yes. Okay. Well, years ago, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema asked this question. Were African people in America before Columbus? When we conduct research, one of the things we have to do is what's called a literature review. And in your lit review, you are determining 
who has done research on this before you have? Because you might think that you're engaging in some new research only to find out, oh, somebody was looking at this in 2010. Somebody was looking at this in 1995. Somebody was looking at this in 1955, right? So in his review of the literature, he found that there were other people that asked this question. But he wrote the book, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America. And, and he found these Olmec stoneheads to be dated at over 3,000 years old. But these didn't come from Africa. These stones came from Mexico. Hmm. Wow, wait a minute, hold on, let's, let's take a look at this. Now, if that's not clear that that's us, <laughs> take a look at the features, y'all. These are clearly African features, and if you want, you can even go around to the back and see the cornrows. Ashe? But he found out that there were a number of European scholars who had done research on this before him. Alexander von Wutenau had done the book Unexpected Faces in Ancient America, and there were others, uh, uh, Leo Wiener out of Harvard University. Many had done this research before him, but how many of you all are aware that even European scientists and researchers who tell the truth are oftentimes silenced? Ashe? Ashe. And just to give you an idea of how massive this is, that's one of my former videographers, Pierre Carson, who's standing next to that particular stone head. And by the way, one of the things that Dr. Van Sertema determined in his research is that that helmet that you see on the head of uh, the Olmec stone head is actually an exact replica of a helmet that was worn in ancient Kemet. Ashe? Ashe. But here's the thing. How is it that Africans were here thousands of years before? This is why if you go to Mexico, you will see pyramids in Mexico that have very similar dimensions to the ones in Kemet. Ashe? Ashe. But, but here is the real difference maker for me. When Africans came to the Americas thousands of years ago, they engaged in cultural exchange rather than cultural extermination of the indigenous population. Ashe? Ashe? And that exchange is reflected in the architecture. Can you see it? Yeah. Dr. David Imhotep has a book called The First Americans Were Africans. And in it, in his review of the research literature, he finds a, uh, a uh, citation from Marquez. He says, the oldest skeletal remains found in the Americas are of blacks. Marquez observed that long ago, the youthful America was a Negro continent. Ashe? Ashe? Was any of this in y'all's textbooks growing up? High school? College? Hold on, grad school. Today? Today? <laughs> Doctoral level? You can go from pre-K to post-doctorate and learn none of this. And I'm not talking about for, for a history major. I'm talking about this needs to be infused into every discipline. The African... Every professor should know the African origins of the discipline that they teach. Well, wait a minute, Dr. Akua. I, I'm a professor of computer science. Thank you. Okay. Well, well, wait a minute. They didn't have computers back then, did they, Dr. Akua? No, they didn't. But the mathematical binary system of zero and ones that you use today to power computers, that mathematical system was started in ancient Kemet. Ashe? Ashe. So when we look at this relationship between African people and indigenous people, this is why we also see similarities between African concepts like the ancient uh, Netzer or goddess Ma'at and Native American dress. Ashe? So whenever you see you know, Native Americans wearing um, their indigenous headdress or feathers and different things, you should see those similarities. But it boils down to this question that one of my elders, Dr. Joyce King, asked, whose knowledge is worth knowing? Whose knowledge is worth knowing? And as we begin to wind down here, I've taken you through one small period of time. There are many periods of time where Black people led the world in scientific innovation, literary production, and wealth creation. Kemet is just one of those places. But we have to ask the question, how did powerful and proud Africans go from this to this? And then, how did we go from this to this? There's been some social engineering going on. Ashe? Ashe. 
Because when you strip a people of their authentic original identity and then you impose an alien cultural identity on them, that's when we begin to see things like that. Ashe? Ashe. So I've had people to ask me over the years, well, all this is really good, but Dr. Kua, but man, I'm trying, I'm just trying to pay the rent. What this got to do with me paying the rent, paying the mortgage, feeding these kids, putting gas in the car, right? I can't answer that question. But Dr. Amos Wilson can and did in his book, The Falsification of African Consciousness. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to read the part that's in bold and underlined when we get to it. I want you to say it in a loud, unified voice. Here we go. If there were not a direct relationship between history and Money. history and power, history and Rulership. history and Foundation. then why is it that the European rewrote history? One more time, everybody. If there were not a direct relationship between history and Money. history and power. history and Rulership. history and then why is it that the European rewrote history, and as Dr. John Henry Clark says, rewrote you and I out of the respectable commentary of history? Our history did not begin in slavery. Ashe? Ashe. And so as I wind down, brothers and sisters, I want you to remember the words of the great civil and human rights activist, Fannie Lou Hamer, who said, never forget where we came from and always praise the bridges that carried you over. If you understand that, you'll understand why James Baldwin said our crowns have been bought and paid for. All we have to do is put them on our heads. And lastly, if you dream of moving mountains tomorrow, you must first begin by moving small stones today. Ashe? Ashe. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Berlin, we have time for Q and A, a little bit of Q and A. Okay. So, in the interest of getting in as many questions as possible, um, if you have a question, um, please state your question within 30 seconds or less, and I will do my best to answer it. Yes, I have sir. A question. So, uh, we were showing the movies. I noticed there were um, black people standing in the background on both sides, mm -hmm. and I just, my eyes kept looking at that. I I'm just, so glad you I caught that. That blew me away. I was like, wait a minute. I'm so glad you caught that, because I didn't. Oh. But that's, that's reflective and emblematic of the fact that we typically tend to stand on the margins of Eurocentric history, that they're placed front and center, and we look like we're just there to assist them in their conquest of the world. <laughs> the few that they didn't kill are there to, you know, to assist in the conquest of the world. And so this is very instructive of, uh, for us, that we cannot wait or expect for other people uh, to tell the truth about our history and culture. We have to be the ones uh, to write it. We have to be the ones to research it. We have to be the ones to finance it as well. And so um, this is why I'm so excited to, to be on this tour, to be able to share this kind of information, because I'm not waiting for anybody else to tell it, and I don't think any of us should. Ashe? Ashe. Thank you for that. Yes? You had a great quote about the minute at the beginning of your talk. Can you tell share again who? Sure. That's from uh, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. Dr. Benjamin E. Mays is the former president of Morehouse College. And the name of that poem is called God's Minute. So if you want to do a Google search, you, you'll be able to find Thank it. You. God's Minute by Benjamin E. Mays. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. You had described the sort of when Africans were going to the Americas, this cultural exchange. Is there any sort of um, reference in later generations in Africa about those cultural exchanges or? Well, what we know from the research literature is that um, I know during the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, Abubakari II was supposed to take the throne. He refused to take the, the throne and chose to explore the world. And so he took a fleet of 200 ships to the Americas, and he never returned. So that kind of gives us, excuse me, some indication into that. 
But of course, this was around in the 13 or 1400s. We know that the ancient Chemites, thousands of years ago, had come to the, what today is called the New World. Um, and so in Dr. David Imhotep's book, The First Africans Were Americans, he demonstrates that Africans were in the Americas 53,000 years ago. So when we think of the typical Native American, the, the, the original picture of a Native American would look very different from what we see today, right? And, and like many African Americans, I have indigenous blood as well. But I understand that the African intersection and connection to all that, which has been diminished and is not oftentimes talked about, okay? But thank you for that question. That's one of the areas that still needs further research, okay? All right, other questions? All right, so I know uh, Dr. Bolin has mentioned that, that she's gonna be raffling off some books. Um, after the books have been raffled off, if, you didn't, if you're not one of the people who wins them, we do have some extras if you want to purchase them. And we encourage you to share uh, this book with as many as possible. In the front cover of the book, there's a QR code that when you scan it, it takes you to 15 brief video clips. Because we know that uh, the way that our children and the way our students attention span has been carefully crafted to only be able to last a few minutes, right? So we have 15 brief video clips that cover key concepts from the book. Also, at the end of each chapter are questions for thought, reflection, and discussion. And this book is used in a number of schools uh, as a part of their, st uh, their freshman studies or uh, college summer bridge programs and English courses or black studies courses and things of that nature. So we hope that you'll share it with as many as possible. Ashe? Ashe. All right. Well, I'll turn it back to over uh, to Boleyn. Dr. Boleyn, I'm sorry. Just another note of gratitude for Dr. Kula. As you saw his busy schedule, he squeezed us in, and I'm so grateful that he did so. There's just a wealth of knowledge and expertise um, that he brings to this work. And as he has mentioned, and I just give you the same charge, please don't allow just this broadening of cultural lens experience that you had here to end here. Continue to do that work and to share that out, especially when you think about our black African-American students and making sure that they know um, the heritage and the legacy of their culture. That is a direct directly connected to their own student success, and I would argue to say their own personal success. So thank you all so much for being here with us. I'll be in touch with you. For those of you, we're going to raffle the names, everyone that's written, um, uh, signed uh, the list, um, raffle those off this afternoon. So I'll be in touch with you between now and tomorrow. Um, uh, but if there is an interest and you're like, I've never got an email, but how do I get the book? Just let me know. We'll make that happen for you. We also have a 3 p.m. session for Dr. Kuhl. We're making him work. He's working today here at PCC. Um, it's faculty focus, but again, if you're like, I just want to spend some more time, listen to Dr. Dr. Kula and the research and his scholarship, please feel free to come right back here at 3 p.m. and join us. And if not, share with a colleague, especially our, 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 um, our faculty colleagues, to join us here at 3 p.m. Thank you so much for being here. Take care of a blessed rest of the day.